All right, well, welcome to Equipping Hour. If you have turned in your books and your Bibles to the book of Micah, then go ahead and turn to the last page of that book, chapter 7. We are going to examine Micah 7, 14 through 20 today. And last week, we looked at Hosea 3 and what the Old Testament prophets expected as it, concerning the return of Christ when he comes to set up his kingdom on the earth and redeem Israel. And today what I want to look at and bring out of the book of Micah is that same period of time, the same event, when Christ returns, and from Micah's perspective, how he deals with the nations. And so remember, even as we're looking back at a book that was written 2,700 years ago, the contents that we're going to examine are still yet future. They haven't occurred yet. And this is all post-rapture of the church time period. And the only two, uh, two groups left on the earth are Israel and the nations. So with that, let's go ahead and read the text that we're going to look at this morning. Micah 7, 14 through 20. Shepherd your people with your scepter, the flock of your possession which dwells by itself in the woodland, in the midst of a fruitful field. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead, as in the days of old. As in the days when you came out of the land of Egypt, I will show you miracles. Nations will see and be ashamed of all their might. They will put their hand on their mouth. Their ears will be deaf. They will lick the dust like a serpent like reptiles of the earth. They will come trembling out of their fortresses. To the Lord our God they will come in dread, and they will be afraid before you. Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession? He does not retain his anger forever, but he delights in unchanging love. He will again have compassion on us, he will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob and unchanging love to Abraham, which you swore to our forefathers from days of old. One of the most fascinating and encouraging things to see as you examine what the Old Testament prophets have to say and you reconcile those things with what the New Testament apostles have to say about this future time frame, is how well they agree on the details. And the, the message and articulation of Old Testament and New Testament writers were appropriate for each uh, respective audience. But the expectation for the unfolding of future events is the same. It's an encouragement to see, but it's not enough to simply put the pieces together. God wants his word to a Hebrew audience 2,700 years ago to have meaningful significance to you in the church today. Even though our expectation is that the content of what we read will take place when the church itself will be raptured off the earth. And so the main point, what I want you to see today, is that the details of God's future plans supply the endurance for your present trouble. The, the details that God discloses about his future plans for his people are where you can anchor your endurance to press on through the trouble you experience today. So I've outlined our text this morning by looking at three truths about God that you need to hang on to to endure the consequences of sin. Three truths that you need to hang on to to endure the consequences of sin. In our fallen world, our, our, our fallen world produces all kinds of obstacles and disappointments, everything from simple mistakes to deliberate words that you can't put back in the bottle, that you can't undo. And our fallen condition produces all kinds of trouble. We don't reason as we ought. Our bodies decay. We bring all kinds of trouble upon ourselves unnecessarily. And our outlook on life can become equally as burdensome when our present difficulties remain stuck at the center of our thinking. 
When sin makes life burdensome, someone else's sin, self-inflicted sin, are simply the consequences of living in a fallen world, we need to be reminded that God has plans for his people. And those future plans are a source of endurance designed by God to get you through your present difficulty. We can see that in how Micah closes his book in chapter 7. 7, 14 through 20 is the last section of a prophecy from God to the southern kingdom of Israel, to Judah, not long before they are taken into exile by the kingdom of Babylon. Israel was about to suffer the avoidable consequences of sin, their own sin. And so in their case, they had brought trouble upon themselves. And maybe you know what that's like. The older you get, you can look back and see mistakes or maybe flat-out rebellion that you're still paying the price for. And yet you can see, by God's grace, that there is kindness in the midst of that. For Micah's generation, they were entrenched in idolatry. Their politics were corrupt internally, and their national alliances were a declaration of independence from God and from his provision. Now, on the surface, things were flourishing. Economically, things were looking good. Those were good days. You can imagine what that's like. I mean, ever since the end of World War II, we in our country have experienced prosperity and a, tra- a trajectory of economic growth that would be the envy of any nation in world history. And yet, the spiritual, the moral decline is an inverse chart. Look at how Micah describes, or God through Micah describes this generation as we get to the conclusion of this prophecy. I just want you to notice a couple things. Turn to chapter 1 and look at verse 3. Here's what God says. For behold, the Lord is coming from his place. He will come down and tread on the high places of the earth. That's a reference to the idolatry in the land. Why will he do that? Well, look at verse 5. All this is for the rebellion of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. How entrenched were their sins and their idolatry? Look at chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Woe to those who scheme iniquity, who work out evil on their beds. In the The morning comes and they do it. For it is in their power to do in the power of their hands. They covet fields and they seize them. And houses they take them away. They rob a man his house, a man his inheritance. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am planning against this family a calamity from which you cannot remove your necks. And you will not walk haughtily, for it will be an evil time. And the consequence of sin was coming. Look at chapter six. In verse 2, the second half of it. Why is this happening? Because the Lord has a case against his people. Even with Israel, he has a dispute. That sounds like what we heard from Hosea last week. And to add insult to injury in Micah's day, Micah's generation had just watched Assyria drag the northern kingdom away into captivity and disperse that nation. And the ones who were left, the ones who were able to escape Assyria, fled south to Judah and brought their idolatry with them. And still, 80 years later, Micah's generation hadn't learned the lesson they could have. And so this was self-inflicted sin, and they had to endure consequences. They knew better. This is that... Uh, verse that you might be familiar with from the book of Micah, Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly before your God. But that's not what characterized this period of Israel's history. So they were going to experience the consequences of self-inflicted sin. Nevertheless, God extends hope to the same generation. His promises to his people are still intact. The northern kingdom of Israel had already been taken away by Assyria, just as Hosea said they would. 
and the rest of the nation was about to be exiled to Babylon. Had God changed his plans? Did he give up on his people? No, because the promises that he had made concerning his plans for his people were predicated on his own character, not the character of those to whom he gave those promises. Micah knows that. And so by the end of this prophecy, you can turn back to chapter 7. He is running towards God, not away from him. Look at what it says in chapter 7, verse 7. Despite the calamity that's coming, as for me, I will watch expectantly for the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. This is the same God who's delivering consequence for sin, and yet here Micah is by faith saying, I'm not going to run away from that. I'm actually going to run towards God. And so verse 14, when we get to our text this morning, verse 14 opens with a, with a prayer, with an appeal to God on behalf of Israel. And this is where you'll find the first truth you need to hang on to to endure the consequence of sin, and that is that God will always be the good shepherd. He will always be the good shepherd. Look at the text. Shepherd your people with your scepter, the flock of your possession. The, the appeal here is for God himself to lead his people. What Mike is asking for here is quite literally for the messianic ruler promised to David to come and establish himself as the king and shepherd over his people. It's not so different than when you pray for Christ to do the same, to, to put an end to everything that's crooked and to straighten out world history once and for all. When, when your life is marked by a humble dependence on the God of the Bible, you can take comfort that your life and your soul are being cared for through all the ups and downs. Trouble that shows up unexpectedly, trouble you invite. When you look up and say, how am I going to deal with this? You, you can trust that the God of the Bible will guide you through the mess. That's what it means to have a shepherd. And that's been true from antiquity. That's been a characteristic of God that we can see all the way back to Genesis. Jacob, on his deathbed at 147 years old, says in Genesis 48, The Lord has been my shepherd all the days of my life. Jacob didn't have an easy life. Always on the move, family strife constantly. But the Lord saw him through. Likewise, David's life was no picnic either. He was the ruler of a nation. He was at the top of the org chart. He had endured trouble of all kinds, self-inflicted, trouble that came to him. And what did he say? Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. The God of the Bible offers a stability through turmoil that no one else can deliver on. In fact, David's son Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, said in Ecclesiastes 12 that the most stabilizing words you will ever hear are given by one shepherd, the Lord God. That's where you need to run to in your trouble. So Micah here, he's praying for the shepherd to come and lead his people. Isaiah, who is a contemporary of Micah, is using the same language in Isaiah 40. Make every path straight. Then the Lord, then the glory of the Lord will be revealed. The Lord God will come in his might. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. These prophets were looking forward to the day that Christ would come in both the gentleness of a shepherd and the power of an undisputed king. Michael looks back at the days of old, verse 14. You can see it there. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead. Michael, or I'm sorry, Michael would have been 
referring back to the days of Solomon when Israel's borders extended the, to the furthest point that they ever had in history, covering nearly all of the land that God had promised to Abraham, almost all of it. And when, when you read Bashan and Gilead, Bashan, you can think of the Golan Heights, northern tip of what is modern-day Israel. Gilead is to the south uh, and, and slightly to the east in Jordan, modern-day Jordan. But even to this day, even though the modern country of Israel controls that area, Bashan and Gilead have never been an undisputed territory since Israel was exiled by Assyria in 722 B.C. And so as Micah is delivering his message, these territories were already in the hands of Assyria, and he, here he is with a message of even more exile. Whoever's left, now you're going to Babylon. But, but Micah hasn't given up on God because he is the good shepherd. Even though the nation would have to, consequent, or the nation would have to experience more uh, consequence for their own sin. So how does he pray? Not altogether different than you might. Your kingdom come, your will be done. This is the, the vein in which he's praying. Micah looks forward knowing that God has always been the good shepherd and says, bring your promises to pass. He's, he's watching what Moses said was going to happen in real time. You, you remember, we talked about this last week from Deuteronomy 30, centuries earlier, God had told the nation before they even possessed the land that they would lose it and that God would regather them and gather them back from the ends of the earth. Micah was watching this dispersion take place. Israel had made friendly with the surrounding nations and they stopped depending on God. The God that gave them the land in the first place, they began to depend on Assyria and Egypt, Babylon for economic growth, for health and political clout. So God, in, in a way, gave them what they asked for. Independence for me, independence on some other nation, okay, you can have that. And they had to suffer the consequence for their sin. Micah knows that the only stability worth running towards is the shepherding care of the God of the Bible. And so Micah, looking forward to that national deliverance that would come later, when Christ returns and defeats the nations that have been against his people from the beginning, he records what is going to happen. He looks forward to that day. This leads us to the second truth that you need to hang on to when you're dealing with the consequence of sin whether it's someone else's or your own. That is that he will defeat every enemy in the end. God will defeat every enemy in the end. Your, your present consequence is not your forever consequence. For the believer, consequences of sin can only last as long as God allows for sin and death to reign on the earth. Experientially, all we know is this coexistence with a fallen state, with a sinful world. And so it, it it's, might seem reasonable that we get stuck on the focus of the trouble that we experience. We don't know any different. We haven't lived any different in, 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 in any different situation but a fallen state in a mixed condition. But, but that's not the forever circumstance that God has prescribed for all of his creation. This is what the Bible calls a temporary existence. Our experience now will be short-lived when you look at the timeline of eternity. 
it's important that we have that frame of thought. Jesus has already removed the sting of death at the cross in his first coming. And at his second coming, he will finally bring peace on the earth, stability, and a Sabbath rest that the world has not known since the Garden of Eden. And at the end of his thousand-year reign as king over the earth, he will put death itself to death. That's what's coming. Whatever the consequence of sin that you have to endure between now and then, whether it's physical, relational, legal, otherwise, if you are in Christ, your present consequence is not your forever consequence. And for Old Testament saints, in Micah's day, verses 15 through 17 would have been a source of hope and encouragement as they look forward to what God had disclosed through the prophet. Despite having to live through the consequences of their own sin and being dragged away by another nation, an enemy nation at this point. Look at what it says in verse 15. As in the days when you came out of the land of Egypt, I will show you miracles. Now, in a quick read of this passage, it could be easy to group together verses 15 with what had just come before, because verse 14 ends with this prepositional phrase of likeness, and then that's, uh, verse 15 begins in that same way, but verse 15 begin, the, the words of verse 15 actually go along with what comes next in verses 16 and 17. And so the, verse 15 goes along with the same idea. Uh, that, that follows. So after Micah appeals to God in verse 14, God responds to him in the first person. And so the quotation marks that you might see in your NAS, if you're reading an NAS, are helpful. As in the days when you came out of the land of Egypt, I will show you miracles. He responds and essentially says, yes, yes, I will bring about those days. And, and they'll be even better. You're praying for what I've already disclosed will happen? Absolutely, that will happen. You can be encouraged. Despite your consequence of being exiled to another nation, I will bring you back. I will establish a kingdom. I will bring judgment on the nations, etc. Th that's what's going on here. He says, do you remember when I brought you out of Egypt? I'll bring about miracles like I did then. Well, you might ask of the test, well, what kind of miracles? What kind of miracles are, is he referring to here? And that might be an ominous, ominous statement as we read it, but Michael knew what God, or Micah knew what God meant. Look at verse 16. This is the outcome of the miracles God will bring about when he comes to shepherd his flock and rule with his scepter. Verse 16, nations will be ashamed of all their might. They will put their hand on their mouth. Their ears will be deaf. They will lick the dust like a serpent, like the reptiles of the earth. I believe that the miracles that God is referring to here have to do with everything that it will take to bring about the messianic expectation that Micah is praying for. When, when God brought Israel out of Egypt, he humbled all the nations that stood in his way. Beginning with Egypt and the ten plagues that devastated the earth. Then a supernatural destruction of Pharaoh's armies. And then, of course, the displacement of all the nations that occupied the land of Canaan where Israel was headed. Do you remember why God sent the plagues on Egypt, the calamity? Calamity after calamity probably took about a, a year or maybe a little bit more as you examine the text. One thing after another that decimated the land, humbled the people when he brought his people out of Egypt. Over and over again, you see the same purpose statements leading up to the Exodus. 
Why did God do this? That the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord God. That you shall know that I am the Lord God. That you may know that there is no God like me. That you may know that I, the Lord, am in the midst of the land. That you may know that the earth is the Lord's. And so in these days ahead, the judgment and calamity that the judgment and calamity that God will bring about on the earth will be like the days when God brought his people out of Egypt. The judgment that God brought on Egypt for rejecting him and stiff-arming his plans were limited geographically and in its scope. He, the Lord humbled the nation, its leaders, and its military. When God brings judgment on the earth in the days leading up to the establishment of his kingdom, that judgment will humble the whole earth. All of its national leaders, every military, every natural and economic resource, the land, the sea, no one will escape the great and terrible day of the Lord. The seal, trumpet, and bold judgments of Revelation 6 through 19 will make it clear to everyone who the earth belongs to. Just as God made it clear to the Egyptians that the whole earth is his and nothing will stand in the way of his plans. Likewise, the Israelites had a successful departure from Egypt, but that didn't mark the end of the miracles. Forty years after they left, Joshua and Caleb led the Israelites into the land that God had promised to them. But the land wasn't vacant. It was occupied. There were established kingdoms in Canaan that stood as a threat against God's people. Against all odds, militarily speaking, God's purposes came to pass and he delivered all of those kingdoms into Joshua's hand. When we were in Israel uh, just a few months ago, we had a wonderful experience being able to go to Tel Hazor, the, the, the town where Joshua uh, went and, and he burned it in Joshua 11. If you recall in that passage, he, 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 he burnt that city, which was the chief of all the tribes, chief of all the cities in the northern part of Israel and Palestine. But he didn't burn the other cities, just Hazor. And, and what was just fascinating to see that just bears witness to the truth of God's word is, is that the excavations that we looked at in that city, you can see the, the burnt marks on that strata of wall that would have dated back to Joshua's time period. And, and so that, that was quite fascinating. They had also unearthed other cities from that same time period, and there's no burn marks because Joshua didn't burn them. Just fascinating. And, just, and it just bears witness to the, the, the reliance that you can have on the word that God has disclosed to us. When Christ returns to establish his kingdom, nations will see and be ashamed of all of their might. When Joshua entered the land, he displaced all of the people that stood in the way of God's plans to establish a nation in that land. When, when Christ comes and brings back all the people that he has dispersed, all of the ethnic Jews, the descendants of Abraham from around the earth, he will bring them back to the land, and there will be no one that stands in the way of his plans. At the moment that he returns, the nations will have their military forces assembled in the Valley of Megiddo for a siege against Jerusalem with the misguided intentions of stamping out God's plans. As we make our way through the book of Revelation, it will become clear that the earth dwellers at that time are not confused over where this wrath and calamity is coming from. They'll say, hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. 
And, and, and again, to add insult to injury, that generation will not only seek refuge, but also seek to stamp out God's plans. And so they will assemble themselves against the epicenter of God's plans, against Jerusalem, and they'll be assembled there in the Valley of Megiddo. And it doesn't go well for them, as you know. And perhaps the most anticlimactic battle ever, Christ will wipe out every enemy and every threat with a word of his mouth. There will be no contest. Listen to the account of John. You can turn to Revelation 19 if you'd like. You don't have to. I'm just going to read uh, John's account of what goes down here. Looking at the same period of time that Micah was looking at, Revelation 19:11. And then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. Down to verse 15. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. There's that scepter language. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God Almighty. When Christ arrives, he puts an end to that as well. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in midheaven, come and assemble for the great supper of the Lord, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and the, of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, and small and great. And I saw the beast, this is the earthly leader at that time, and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized, not much of a battle there. He's just seized. And with him, the false prophet. And then skip down to verse 21. The rest were killed with a sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the throne. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. You cannot stand in the way of God's plans. Even if it means bringing together all the strength of the nations military strength, economic strength, geopolitical clout, when you consider the, the gravity and, and what we might consider strength, we look at those categories and say, we've, we've got enough military strength to blow ourselves up at least 100 times. Our economic power is, is enough for prosperity for all, wherever it's at. And our geopolitical clout is coming together in ways that we can either work together or against each other but when it comes to standing in the way of God's plans, none of it will add up to anything. All of it will be put in its place in just a moment. So what happens next? Well, looking back in Micah, in our passage in verse 17, go ahead and look at the second half of that. What happens after that account of Revelation 19 when Christ does return and waylay his enemies? It says, They will come trembling out of their fortresses. To the Lord God they will come in dread, and they will be afraid before you. This word fortresses, uh, in my NAS translation, uh, I, the Translation stronghold from the ESV is probably a better word. There's nothing inherent about this particular word that is related to a military position. The, the Septuagint actually translates this word confinement. And so, of course, you get the idea. You, you, have, you have locked yourself down, confined yourself in protection of whatever's on the outside. Well, what's happening? Where, where have the people been? And why have they confined themselves? Well, what's been happening the last three and a half years? The wrath of God on the earth. And now the one who has been 
uh, delivering that wrath has personally come. And so when he calls the nations to himself, they come in dread. All those who are left, military is gone, political leadership is gone, and, and what's left but the people of the nations. So now, with the return of Christ, the wrath of God on the earth has come to an end. And what's left of them are assembled before him, appropriately afraid. And, and God's word is just so precise. You can take it at face value. The, the most vivid account of this moment is found in the Olivet Discourse of Matthew 24 and 25. Go ahead and turn there with me. Jesus is sitting there on the Mount of Olives with his disciples just days before he goes to the cross, and he's made it clear that he is indeed the good shepherd. He is indeed the Messiah. He's indeed the king that the Old Testament has been expecting. But he wasn't going to set up his kingdom yet. And so his disciples are asking the obvious question, okay, well, when? Look at verse uh, 24, verse 3. As he, Christ, was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Well, first, he says, there will be a great tribulation. Look at verse 21. After saying, don't be mistaken, it's going to be a while. People are going to come and say, I'm he. Don't be led astray. He says, for then after that, there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would, be, would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days have been cut short. Skip over to verse 29, but immediately after those days, after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give, it, give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and then the, all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a, trump, a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. Do you remember Deuteronomy 30 from last week? He's, remember, before they had even entered the land, you're going to lose the land, but then I'll bring you back. If your outcasts are at the ends of the earth, from there the Lord God will gather you. And from there he will bring you back. It's, it's almost like God's word is consistent from beginning to end. It's almost like you can take it at face value. Look at verses 25. Uh, 31, go to, go to chapter 25, 31. Verse 31. But when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them from one another. As a sheep, I'm sorry, as a, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. This sheep and goats judgment will bring an end to the present age. And it will inaugurate the, the kingdom that the Old Testament saints and New Testament saints alike have been looking forward to. And for the generation that has endured the wrath of the Lamb... On the earth, the difference between inheriting the kingdom and eternal punishment is how they responded 
to what God had revealed about himself and his plans for his people. Let's just keep reading that passage, verse 33, or 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous, how do you become righteous again? Walking by faith. Taking God at his word. Believing what he said is true. God call, Jesus calls them the righteous. Then the righteous will answer him and saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to see you? Then the king will answer and say to them, truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these, who are these? The ones that have been gathered from all corners of the earth, standing there. These brothers of mine. Then, even the least of them, then you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you did, gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves will also answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? And he will answer them and say, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The righteous, even in this future time period, walk by faith. And even after the church was removed from the scene, and along with it, the pillar in support of the truth, the same thing has been true since the beginning of time. God has never given less than enough for his own, for, for his people to walk by faith. He's never given enough, uh, he's never given less than enough of his own self-disclosure for his image bearers to walk by faith. He, 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 will, he was the, he was always the good shepherd. He was before, he, he is now, and he will be later. He, he will defeat every enemy in the end. No, no matter what kind or where it comes from. Thre threats, affliction, self-inflicted sin, and eventually death. And he will also deliver on every promise. That's the third section that we're going to look at, beginning in verses 18, uh, 18 through 20. He will deliver on every promise. What promises? Well, for one, repentance. He promised Israel that he would heal their apostasy. We looked at that in Hosea 14.4 last week. Even though Israel would be banished around the world and scattered, and later Judah would be taken into captivity to have to endure the affliction of their enemies, which was the consequence of their own, uh, their own avoidable sin, as they declared independence from God, independence on their neighbors. They wouldn't be condemned forever. God would heal their apostasy, a future generation. Do you remember the two purposes for the day of the Lord, the wrath of the Lamb? Right? The, the, the judgment of the nations and the repentance of Israel. So the nations have already been judged, and, and look what comes next. 
verse 18. Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession? This is an expression of repentance. Not as they're being exiled to Assyria or taken captive to Babylon. In Micah's day, he witnessed Assyria coming in and taking the north. And Babylon was about to take the rest of them. But a future generation, a generation that looks on Christ who they pierced and weeps for him as though for an only child. When God eventually rescues that generation, he will do so by squeezing the world with his wrath and bringing them to repentance. He will humble them into repentance as he humbles the rest of the world into judgment. Their, their present consequence is not the forever consequence for those who had put their trust in God's plan, who had put their trust in Christ. Look at verses 18, uh, the end of 18. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. That's that characteristic that we see over and over in the Old Testament, his, his loving kindness. He will again have compassion on us, Micah says. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. If, if you've placed your trust in Christ, then the affliction that you experience now, the Bible calls light and momentary. Whether it's thrust upon you or the consequence of your own sin, Paul says that he doesn't put his focus on today. He says, For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Why is it not worthy to be compared? I mean, it's hard. Life can become very difficult, especially when you're in the midst of your own sin, when you're in the midst of affliction or sin on, uh, on the account of others. How, 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 can, how can the only experience in a mixed condition that we've ever known be not even wor uh, worthy of being compared to the glories that will come? It's because we have our sin forgiven. That's why. C Christians have their sin forgiven. And so it's not, it's not worth fixing your attention for too long on the difficulties of this world. He gives you the resource and the difficulties of this world together, but one day the difficulties will be gone, and all we will have left is our forgiven sin and unity with Christ in perfect existence forever. It's the same reason why Micah expresses this outburst of rejoicing over this future generation Look at the rest of verse 19. Yes, you will cast all of their sins into the depths of the sea. That's what it's like to be a Christian. To have your sins forgiven and cast off. And, and not only do they get their sins forgiven, but they inherit everything that was promised to their forefathers. Look, look at verse 20. You, God, will give truth to Jacob. An unchanging love to Abraham, which you swore to our forefathers from days of old. The modifying phrases here, these qualifying phrases, the, the promises that you swore, the promises from days of old, this language implies that when God delivers on his promises, he'll be delivering on the literal expectation that was conveyed to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Those patriarchs live their lives banking them, banking their lives on the promises that God had given to them just as they were conveyed. And God will deliver on those expectations. He'll also deliver on the promises to save everyone who comes to him in repentance and faith. 
In the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew spends the first four and a half chapters proving that Jesus of Nazareth was indeed the Messiah that all the Old Testament prophets expected to arrive on the scene. That he, that he met every qualification and every expectation from, from Abraham, from Eve, all the way down to Malachi. And, and, he, and he says, and, and, and he records the ministry of Christ beginning in chapter 4, verse 17. And what does he say? He says, Jesus went preaching, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If you don't know what it's like to repent from sin and put your faith in Christ, talk to me, talk to someone who brought you, some, someone who's sitting next to you, because if you don't, then you will be fixated on the trouble of this world. But Christians with forgiven sin and a future expectation can live heavenly-minded. We want to be those Christians. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for the book of Micah. Lord, thank you for everything that you've conveyed to us. Thank you that we can trust your word, that when you delivered it, you delivered it plainly, that when we read it, we can understand it, Lord, you've preserved your word as well. And you've done that because all of it is revel relevant to us. Even as we're reading about future times from past prophets, we can take away that you, you are indeed the good shepherd, Lord. That you forgive sin. That you make good on every promise. And in the end, you'll defeat every enemy. Every national enemy. Every spiritual enemy physical enemy, and eventually death itself. We look forward to that day, Lord. We love you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.